Thanks, Tom. One of the things that Tom mentioned just reminded me we wanted to begin announcing that the uh, last Sunday of April, we are planning a special Sunday called Go Sunday. Go stands for go. And uh, we are actually planning that day to have prearranged different areas where we are able to give and do service and get out into our community, into people's lives, into our neighbors, into what's going on in our city, and do some things as a church family that are going to make a lasting impression, but are going to do some practical good in people's lives. So I'm just telling you, save the date, all right? The last Sunday of April, go Sunday. And we'll have more details for that. We're going to be asking you to commit to some things. It's a way of giving, and that's one way that we can do what we have just been exhorted to do. Uh, Carrie's grandpa, Grandpa Hart, was a short guy. And like the rest of the Hart family, he was a short guy. He was a decorated World War II veteran, and he uh, had fought in World War II in combat. He had also been an amateur boxer in Carthage, Missouri, so short or not, he was a fairly tough guy. His name was Oren Hart, Jr. A lot of people just knew him as Jr., and his wife, Helen, Grandma Hart, called him oftentimes June for short. He didn't care for that. And one day at a doctor visit, we heard this story from them. One day at a doctor visit, she came out. He was waiting in the waiting room with some other people. And she came out ready to go. And she said, come on, June, let's go. And he didn't answer her. He didn't look at her. In fact, he didn't do anything that would acknowledge to the people around him any, any kind of connection with that name, June, lest they think his name was June, even if it meant throwing his wife under the bus, which he did that day. There is a certain interesting group of people who are going to be standing before Jesus on judgment day wanting to enter into heaven and rather than appealing to the grace of God as the reason they might be allowed, these people in desperation are going to turn to the things that they have done on behalf of Jesus. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, Matthew chapter 7, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Can you imagine the terrible, ominous blast of those words coming from Jesus to you? I never knew you. It's a strong word, strong words in the original. It's at no time, at no time did I ever know you, not ever. And Jesus said there in Matthew 7, that scene is going to be a part of of judgment day, he will say to some group of people, I never knew you. That means that there are people who claim to be doing things in the name of Jesus, who try to attach his authority to all kinds of activity, and it's not his agenda at all. Folks, that is a group of people I don't want to be standing with. Amen? Amen. That group saying, Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name. You know us. We used your name all the time, sometimes just to start sentences. We used your name in our wedding a few times. We started organizations and movements in your name. We had your name on the back of our car. We had your name over our church doors. We used your name at the end of prayers And somehow, this group of people that he describes in Matthew 7 were not on Jesus' team at all. And their activity missed the point. There's a graphic of that, by the way, what it looks like to miss the point. I hope I can make it magically appear. There it is. That's a picture of someone missing the point. 
Not only will he not claim them as some of his most important servants, he will not even acknowledge knowing them. I don't want to be standing with that bunch of people. I want to be with a group of people who understood Jesus' agenda, Jesus' plan, and then who lived like they wanted his plan to get done. Amen? And that's enough to send me looking really carefully into the things that Jesus said are his plan, which is what we're focusing on for five more weeks, Jesus on purpose. We want to look at the purposes of Jesus. We want to align ourselves with the purposes of Jesus so that at the end of these days, we can be found standing in the right crowd in front of him. Now, if Jesus had just flat out told us the point of what he was doing, if Jesus had just said, now here's why I am here, here is my agenda, well, that would be something I'd want to look at real carefully. And then I think if I did, I'd come up with a pretty useful list of things that I could do to make sure I was doing what Jesus cared about, couldn't I? My guess is, that we're all interested in that, or else we wouldn't be sitting here right now this morning. My guess is we've got some degree of interest in that. What does Jesus want us to do? I'm interested in that. Well, the book today that we're going to look at is Luke's Gospel. So please open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. It gives us a couple of looks into the mission of Jesus. One of those looks that Luke gives us is very early in the ministry of Jesus. It's in chapter 4. Jesus is visiting his old hometown of Nazareth, and he's in the synagogue teaching, and there he turns to the prophet Isaiah. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus turns to the prophet Isaiah and reads a prophecy about himself. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus oftentimes spoke about his mission in an effort to correct some misunderstanding about it. Well, that day in Nazareth, the crowd didn't understand. They missed the point. They missed the point of his coming, and he told, he told them in clear terms, but they came after him and wanted to drag him out and throw him off of a cliff. Well, today we're going to look in chapter 19 in Luke, again, at Jesus telling us why he came. And it is just a short story. You'll see what I mean. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, The half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus often gave these purpose statements to correct some misunderstanding about his mission and what he was doing. And that's verse 10 here in Luke. Luke chapter 19, verse 10 is really the whole key to the book of Luke. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, if you hear that and you go, so what? Well, then I refer you back to the group of people whom Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. 
you workers of lawlessness. How can we say we really know Jesus? How can we say we really love Jesus and then not care about the things that matter to him? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Look at that with me just a little more carefully. First of all, he says he came to seek. Living life in Jesus' purposes means that you and I, followers of Jesus, are seekers, right? For many years, many churches were focused on being seeker-friendly. That meant that they gave a lot of attention to what can we do for people who are not yet followers of Jesus to feel comfortable, to feel welcomed, to feel like they belong. What can we do? And they made themselves what they called seeker-sensitive. And those people who came to worship with the believers or who came to be a part of a small group, well, they were looking for something, and so they were referred to as seekers. Seems to me that today, fewer people can be considered seekers of Jesus. Have you noticed that? Fewer people are likely to do that. So a lot of churches have changed their strategies. Back in chapter 15 of Luke, Jesus tells three stories about lost things. A lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. And the owner of the sheep and the owner of the coin become, here's the word, seekers. Something is lost and so they go looking for it. They're seekers. Coin can't very well find itself. A coin can't come looking Sheep aren't very good at being found. And even the story about the lost son gives a little more insight into the son's need that he had to take some action too. But when he did, he found that his father ran to him because he was seeking a restored relationship with his son. Jesus is a seeker. Carrying on Jesus' purposes We followers of Jesus, we're the seekers. The largest number of people, think about this, the largest number of people who need to be introduced to life in Jesus are people who today aren't going to come here. Not on their own. The average Joe isn't going to wake up next Sunday morning and go, oh, I wonder what they're doing at 6595 Guilford Road today. I think I'll get dressed and go to Central Christian Church and see what's going on there. Even Zacchaeus, look at the story, isn't someone who is trying desperately to make a connection with Jesus. Luke says that he was trying to find Jesus to see who he was. There was some curiosity. He's not the seeker. Jesus said that day, the Son of Man came to seek. So what does that make you? Well, if I'm reading this correctly this morning, it means you're either like Zacchaeus and you're someone who has not yet made the decision to follow Jesus, or you're like that crowd of people who complained about the way that Jesus is, or you're like Jesus and you're a seeker looking for people who need to be found. The Son of Man came to seek. He also says he came to seek and to save. Jesus said he is a seeker who's on a rescue mission. He's passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, by the way, to die. That's what Jesus is doing. He's on a very important trip, but he is stopping off in that trip to interrupt the life of a squirrely tax agent. And it may have looked to everybody else like some kind of a social visit when Jesus said, I'm going to your house. But the agenda was a whole lot deeper than that. And I wondered as I was rethinking this story, what if you and I were to take our social stops in life and everyday things like that and turn them into rescue stops? 
You're going through the drive through line. Did you know that the person in the window that you're going to drive by has a name and a story? You're picking up your kids after school or from practice, and there's another mom there. That other mom has a life too. Welcome to your circle of influence. The guy came to fix your furnace. Oh, you're so glad. Turns out you're not the only one in the world that's got problems. Suddenly, you've got a chance to help that guy fix something that's broken in his life. When we followers of Jesus use this word, get saved, to save someone, we don't mean that as an insult to people who are followers of Jesus. And if that's you this morning, you're not yet a follower of Jesus. If you're joining us online and you hear us saying, yeah, Jesus wants to save you, what we mean to say by that is we were saved. Amen? We were saved from life outside of Jesus. We were saved, and we want you to be saved too. We didn't make up that word. Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's another word, by the way, we didn't come up with. It's how Jesus describes people who are outside of life in him, lost Look again back here in Luke 19 at the description of our diminutive hero. He is a chief tax collector, it says, and he was rich. Those two things go together. Tax collectors were contracted by the Roman government. Their job was to generate revenue for the government. Zacchaeus has some kind of regional manager position over these guys. He is a chief tax collector. It was a fairly common practice of tax collectors in those days to come up with some kind of phony valuation about property and income and jack up the cost to people. It was also a fairly common practice if you couldn't pay what they said you owed in taxes that your friendly local tax guy could also double as a loan shark who'd be glad to float you the money at a horrible interest rate. Any of this sound familiar? What do we call today a person who lies and cheats and steals his way into wealth? (laughs) Be careful. I know there's several that come to mind, aren't there? Well, they're often called today's successful people. Jesus calls them lost In fact, the word that's used here is more than a word than than just wandering around. It's the name in Revelation 9, it's it's the name of the Apollyon, the angel who is the destroyer. It's a word that Peter uses in 2 Peter to describe what the flood did to the world. It's a word that means someone is headed for absolute destruction. He's the guy in the open barrel in Niagara Falls headed for the edge. Lost. And that is why a person needs to be saved. Jesus has gone to be the guest in that guy's house. (laughs) Jesus, why are you going to the house of a sinful person? Because he's a lost person. That's why. And because the Son of Man came to seek and to save lost people. Yep. Yep, there are some pretty bad people out there, aren't there? Well, I'm glad too, because they make me feel better about myself. Anytime I can point to somebody else and make myself look better, I find a way to do that. That makes me feel better. Yeah, there's a lot of those people out there. So what the crowd was doing in Luke 13. Luke chapter 13. You can almost hear that attitude. Verse 1, there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners, worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? 
No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Let me ask you something this morning. If you haven't completely given over your life to Jesus yet, why not? You see, Christ followers aren't people who are up on high horses just looking around for others that we can point to so that we can feel more self-righteous. No, we're the people who sing the, the first verse of Amazing Grace. I was wretch. I was lost. I was blind. The more we become like Jesus, the more we're thankful and the more we're grateful for his grace and the more we want for other people to have that too. We want for people not to perish. Amen? Because the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We have a really good doctor. And a lot of you know that over the past uh, months, Carrie and I have been dealing with some health things for her. He ordered some tests to be done on her right before her surgery that she really needed done could be done. So they started conducting all these tests, and the tests showed that she had a heart problem that needed to be addressed. He got the results of that. He called us late at night at home. He was explaining it to me. He said it was likely going to result in a postponement of Carrie's surgery, and it did. Eight months now, by the way. Eight months. And instead of having the surgery we really wanted her to have, she had to have a heart procedure that probably saved her from disaster, for which I'm very thankful. I'd like to keep her around, I told her. All right. So next time something like this comes up, should Dr. Gray just not order those tests? Should he say, well, I better not look at the test results because those might be upsetting? Should he say, I don't want to tell them what the test said and upset them? Should he say to us, well, the tests say this, but you don't have to believe it? Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, and I'm thankful so is anyone else who follows him. How can we not have our lives be all about that now? I'll tell you how. People, people who misunderstand, people who are driven by selfishness, people who have lousy worldviews, people who are used to other people around them being that same way, that's how that can be disrupted. Because when someone comes along that's different, it raises questions. It raises questions in your own mind and in the mind of other followers of Jesus too. And I want to tell you something, that the answer to the questions that that activity raises are found, it's, it's found in verse 10. The answer is found in verse 10 of Luke 19. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So I want to finish out this morning by doing this kind of differently. I want to take that answer and then I want to apply it to several questions. I like to say sometimes, I'm glad you asked that. Well, I think verse 10 is a great answer to a lot of glad you asked that's. Maybe you're facing some of these. Maybe the changes that you make today because of Luke 19 are going to raise some of these questions around you. And if we take this aspect of following Jesus the way that we should, we're going to be misunderstood. And we're going to be criticized. And so when that happens to you, and when that happens to me, I want to have a good answer. When someone looks at me and says, why are you doing this? I want to have the right answer. And the answer, you can say it with me, is for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's try that. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's the answer. Here are some questions that answers. Why the radical change in Zacchaeus? This guy, look at it, just stood up and announced that he is going to instigate his own personal economic recession in his home. 
He's going to give away more than 50% of his net worth. He is also publicly acknowledging that he is a crook and he is holding himself accountable to everybody that heard him that day. Everyone who is listening, he said it. He said he is changing, not I am going to change. I am changing. Why? Here's the answer. Because the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And when someone encounters Jesus and comes face to face with his agenda and accepts that, it causes a change in his heart, and that heart change produces a change in life. People who were headed for destruction are now grateful people. This past week, Benjamin Hall gave an interview. How many of you saw something about Benjamin Hall, the journalist, this past week? Uh, This week will be the one-year anniversary of the day that he survived an attack in Ukraine. It'll be this Tuesday. Hall was a war correspondent. The other four people who were in the car with him all died. And he was seriously injured. But it was interesting to me to listen to Benjamin Hall Blind in one eye, missing one leg, missing a foot, hand seriously injured. So far, that's his problems. Speaking with gratitude and speaking with humility about all the people and all the events that led to him being saved. And that's the title of a book that he has now put out, Saved. People change. Because they've been saved. Even people like Zacchaeus. Here's another question. Why go looking for people outside of your plans today? That's a fair question, isn't it? You're a busy person. You've got stuff to do. And anybody who steps in on that will mess those plans up, won't they? Anybody that you seek out is going to mess up those plans. People who need help, people who are hurting, people who don't have hope, who are lonely, scared, confused, angry, harassed. They're not on your to-do list today, are they? Why go looking for people like that? Why go looking for that kind of disruption to your schedule when you've got other plans? Here's the answer. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Because for people who love Jesus, those outside people are the plan. And for many of us, that's what's missing. We need to plan to include into every day some way that other people are going to hear from us about life in Jesus. You know, sometimes you sit and write a sermon and and preach it, and then you find out you're speaking to yourself. I hope you can listen to me talk to myself for a moment. A lot of us wear tracking devices on our wrist. You got that? One of those, you know, by the end of the day, you're looking at it going, how many steps did I do today? Uh Uh-oh. I found out that if you will peel potatoes, you can get lots of steps in. (laughs) Lots of us are looking, you know, we've got a goal on our wrist. And the goal is by the end of the day, I will have walked more than any steps, all right? And you start looking in that and going, oh, I haven't done enough yet. I'd better do those today, right? What if, what if we did the same thing about whether or not today I have interjected my faith into the life of another person? What if we looked at the day, and before the end of the day, it was a goal that somehow, somewhere today, I'm going to speak for Jesus. I'm going to interject my faith into someone's life, however great or small that might be. Because the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Here's another question. Why be pushy, unconventional, uninhibited, authoritative, bold? Sometimes to fit those other people into our plans on any given day, we're probably going to need to become something we don't like being. Now, some people are already those things. They delight in being those things. And if that's you, okay, 
This will be easier for you. Good for you. You're not going to have to work as hard at this. But for others, to speak when everyone else is silent, to engage in awkward conversations, to stand up against the cultural norm that's developing around us, that's going to be as unnatural as it can be. Why do that? The answer, because the Son of Man came to seek and to save, I can't hear you, the lost. Are lost people really in danger or not? Because if we really believe they are, then you and I will do unconventional things to save them. This isn't true of just us as individuals. This is true of us as central Christian church. And when we do something unconventional as a church family and somebody looks at us and says, why are we doing this? Remember the answer. It's the same for another question. Why do the things that make other people grumble? <laughs> do you see it there in chapter 19 in Luke? When Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus' life, did you notice the reaction it says of everyone else? Everyone else. They hated the guy. Did Jesus just need a free lunch? <laughs> Was Jesus just interested in looking into the lifestyles of the rich and squirrely in Jericho? Could he have eaten with dozens of other people who would have been glad to invite him? I think probably yes. Instead, Jesus often visited the people who had shady reputations to the point where Jesus was wrongly labeled shady himself. Why choose the one person who upset everybody? Maybe it was a learning opportunity for all of them. Remember, Jesus gave this answer to set people's thinking straight, didn't he? The answer is because the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Has anybody grumbled about you lately because you did something in an effort to seek and save a lost person? Ouch. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Here's one more question. The question is, why are you the catalyst for joy and hope in a dark place? Because I can tell you, if anybody didn't deserve to have joy in his house that day, it was the guy who had robbed other people of their possessions. If anybody didn't deserve to have salvation come to his house that day, it was the Jewish turncoat who had done so much to take away from the lives of all the people around him. Why bring joy, why bring real hope into the life of a person who doesn't deserve it? Because the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We don't need this morning to bother sitting around trying to figure out who deserves this and who doesn't. Jesus already settled that question for us. The answer is none of us do. I didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. Nobody else does. I want instead to encourage us to, to take up Paul's instructions as he writes a letter from prison to the church in Philippi. It's in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering 
of your faith. I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. That's Paul writing from prison. Because the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's the answer. That's the answer we need to leave with here today. I don't want to be with that group of people that Jesus looks at and says, I never knew you. I want to stand with the group of people who say, I understand what Jesus wants. And in his name, I'm going to do what he wants. You can be that today. Even if in the story, you're Zacchaeus, you're the one who still hasn't given his life over to Jesus. You're thinking about that. You're looking at him. You're learning about him. And you're considering, I need to make this change. Zacchaeus did. You could do that today. His invitation isn't something that we conjured up or something that we wrote. It's, it's the invitation that Jesus made for anybody that wants to come to him. And if you would do that today, the way to do that is really quite simple. It's not a small thing, but it's easy to understand. You quit being the one that's in charge of your life, and you give him control of your life. You let him be Lord, which means doing whatever it is he wants you to do. He said that to do that, you need to acknowledge him before people. You need to recognize and not be ashamed of him and say, I do believe that Jesus is who he said he is, the Son of God. You need to get to him as the one who can save you rather than being your source of salvation in life. He says you need to come, and when you do that, to be baptized into him. And he promises there that that old person is going to be buried and a new person is going to be raised up to live a new life in him. You can do that today. So we're inviting you on behalf of Jesus to come. Stand up with me if you would. Think about the story that we've looked at today. Think about your life before Jesus Christ and whatever decisions we need to make for him right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this answer that Jesus gave, one that we need to carry with us, a load, Lord, that he has placed on us now as his church, as he's waiting to come again. Lord, help us with the heart of Jesus and, and with the eyes of Jesus to seek and to save the lost. We were there. Somebody sought us out. Somebody introduced us to Jesus. And Father, I pray that now that we would just carry that on. That we would be disciples, making disciples who will do the same. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that one day we can stand with Jesus as our advocate Thank you for his forgiveness, won for us on the cross. And Father, I pray our responses now to that will reflect our acceptance of that truth. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.